Welcome back to this constant contact series where we can into to discuss the process of what it can look like for someone to go through deconstruction or deconversion. And today we're going to focus in on the death of a thousand and one cuts. In January 23rd of 2023, in a blog that Philip Yancey wrote, he recounted a long-lasting and standing email conversation he had with Bart Campolo. For those of you who don't know, Bart is the son of the famous Baptist speaker Tony Campolo. Now, while he, Bart, was once a Christian and teacher himself, he ultimately declared himself an atheist and launched a new career as a humanist chaplain and podcaster. Bart and Philip were reflecting on Yancey's book and memoir, Where the Light Fell. The blog begins with Bart's own words where he says, First of all, thank you for thinking of me that way. You are right, of course, about me identifying with some of your story. But honestly, given my impressions of our few conversations, I was surprised by how little our journeys have in common. Indeed, one might fairly say we are polar opposites. You've worked out and kept faith in a good, loving, and distinctly Christian God in the face of a thousand and one life experiences, suggesting no such person exists. Well, I've let go of that same story despite growing up with every emotional, economic, and spiritual privilege imaginable and having more than my share of moments when the Holy Spirit seemed to be whispering in my ear. While many people might um, ultimately use a crisis point to leave their faith or give them permission to start deconstructing, there are many like Bart Campolo who at some point will look back at their life and faith and realize that their faith died slowly from the death of a thousand and one life experiences, or what I like to call the death of a thousand cuts. The strange thing about this perspective is we define the existence or non-existence of God based on our own experiences of this sinful world and not on the truth of God who was, is, and forevermore will be. Now, a little later on in the same section, Bart continues his questioning of God based on Philip's own life experiences. Please don't get me wrong, Philip. I'm not suggesting that the Jesus you met as the Good Samaritan in the little prayer room wasn't genuinely present to you. Rather, I'm wondering why, after all the terrible, it's this branded nonsense you'd endured to that point. You kept seeking out that experience or even stayed open to it, even though you don't yet uh, you'd not yet seen any indication that Christianity was a sane or reliable pathway to love and happiness. In other words, I'm wondering why you cooperated with a worldview that hitherto had only let you down. Now, I've been working on a side project that I mentioned a few times called The Confessions of a Pastor. There are two sections in the book that, um, where I'm talking about my own experiences of this sinful world. The first section is called The First Fall, contemplating Adam and Eve's own sin and their fall from Eden um, to then consider how it affected me as a young boy. The second section, though, is called The Second Fall. In that section, I contemplate my experience in my, in my first lead pastor at call in Colorado, where I experienced the realities of the fall in a different way, this time through the church I was serving. I think the easiest way to summarize at least part of my time in Colorado was this. There was one person on the nominating committee who, as I understood it, gave their approval to offering the position to me, and then they left the church before I ever got there. I never understood what happened there other than to see that person say one thing, then turn around and do another. Now, there are two realities in this world that I'm convinced that many of us may have been told, but even if we were told, we outright ignored the advice. The first is this, this world is broken and bad things will happen. From a Christian point of view, the Bible calls this sin. Yes, Jesus died for our sins, but we live in, um, we will not be completely delivered from our sins until Jesus returns, or at least the realities of this sinful world. Even Jesus said the hungry will always be among you. And when I read this say, statement, I often think that you can replace the hungry with other um, broken aspects of this world to say that the naked will always be among you or there will always be a murder or death amongst you and so on and so forth. Therefore, 
Jesus told us that our work will never be completely over because he calls us to care for the vulnerable even and he even love our enemy despite the things that are going on around us. Second, and maybe more importantly, because this world is sinful, it means people are sinners. The pastor I worked with under in Overland Park, Tim Wagner, put it this way, the church would be great if it was not for the people. And to be completely honest with you, when he first said that, I thought to myself, can, can you even say that? But then I realized Timothy Keller agreed with that sentiment. He pointed out in the book, The Reasons for God, that because Christianity believes we are both sinners who also can be saved by grace, then there is something about Christians that inevitably we are equally hypocrites. Now, as you continue to listen to someone like Bart Campolo's thought process play out, you will very quickly find that he has decided the existence of God is based off the evidence the fallen and broken world gives us. As we return to Campolo's and Yancey's interaction, you will see that both Bart and Philip encountered hardships over and over again. Bart walked away from the faith while God found Philip. In the quote I referenced from Bart earlier, Campolo is basically saying that our bad experiences disproves God. If this is true, one doesn't need to live very long to have plenty of evidence to disprove God. If this is true, every Christian should stop believing in God at one point or another. It's just a matter of how many cuts of faith can take until it dies. Now, if Bart's assumption is true, then one should be able to assume that anyone throughout Scripture who faces hardship would eventually deconstruct and deconvert from the faith. Two examples come to mind specifically in terms of the many that I could refer to, but the two that come to mind are Job and Joseph. In Job's, in Job's case, I mean, he literally loses everything and has every reason to deconstruct or deconvert from his faith. faith. Yet, the text itself says that Job remained faithful and Job is even admonished by God for questioning who is in charge of our very life and death. In Joseph's case, his life is turned upside down by first his brothers beating him and leaving him for dead, only for Joseph to end up as a slave. Then Potiphar's wife accused Joseph of attempted rape after he rejected her advances, which ultimately places him in prison. Even still, when Joseph ascends to power as a high official and finally has a chance to exact revenge on his brothers, who are the catalyst for his terrible experience, he instead says, What you meant for evil against me, God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Both Job and Joseph have some of the worst experiences and every reason to deconstruct or deconvert from the faith, but don't. Rather, they both give us a framework of how God is still God, even when the world is crashing in around us. Now, the greatest example of this is found through Jesus Christ. While Job and Joseph are great examples of how the world will fail us, they still pale in comparison to what Jesus faced. Jesus was rejected in his hometown. The Pharisees were constantly out to kill him even though he was a good teacher. And eventually, every one of his disciples would deny him. While Jesus may have had deep emotions about everything that had happened to him, he always relied on God, his heavenly Father, and he kept pushing forward and he even endured the scrutiny of the cross. As I faced what I did in Colorado, I started seeing Jesus' words on Calvary very differently when he prayed to God about the crowds who called for his very death when they said, for, when, we, when he said, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus then gives us the framework for not only how we are to follow him through offering equally relentless forgiveness, but he equally is the reason for why we continue to serve the least of these. Although Bart Campolo's deconstructed or deconversion from the Christian faith, he now serves as a humanist chaplain. What is particularly strange about this is that even he himself will reference Jesus' work to be what he modeled his own work after. He suggests that he believes in the efficacy of Jesus' life, but then denies his death and resurrection. 
I came upon another interview with Bart Kempo in the documentary The American Gospel called um, Christ Crucified. At one point, he suggests that he looked at all the brokenness of the world and that he came to a certain peace when he accepted the fact that all we have is what we can do for each other in these terrible situations. I found this incredibly depressing for Bart to somehow base what he does on Jesus' own actions, but ultimately does not find any hope in Jesus' promises. Jesus promised us that when he returns, all wrongs will be made right and the hungry will be fed. Equally, Paul outright tells us in Romans 8, 18, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that it, he will reveal to us later. From a biblical perspective, they warn us that the thousand and one cuts will come. In fact, in this life, the con cuts will sometimes seem endless, and it would be easy to throw up our hands and call it quits. But the Bible also points out that despite what seems like an endless amount of cuts, it is actually but a momentary affliction that cannot compare to the glory that will come. We know the road to glory is narrow, and not all will continue on the way to that celestial city, much like we see in the classic tale, Pilgrim's Progress. Yet, for those who do endure the cuts, for them there will be a heavenly crown. As we go through this momentary affliction, may we never lose sight of where we are going and in whom we are being taken there through. I pray that this continues to be a blessing in your life. I hope to see you all uh, this evening once you see this video at our end of the year fellowship meal barbecue and to just have community and time together. Pray to see you soon. But until then, uh, have a fantastic week. God bless.